I found this Red Bull patent describing the use and synthesis of this compound, called CE123. This molecule is an analog of the better known modafinil, a medication used to promote wakefulness, primarily to treat narcolepsy and other sleep-related disorders. It is also used by healthy people as a type of smart drug, supposedly enhancing your cognition and improving your ability to focus. CE123 is similar to modafinil in this regard, as it was found to improve memory and learning for several hours after one oral dose, without the downsides of the side effects that modafinil can bring. Modafinil and CE123 are both dopamine reuptake inhibitors, similar to the better known methylphenidate. Dopamine in particular regulates various reinforcing functions, such as learning, reward, and memory. These types of compounds are also known under the name nootropics, brain supplements, or smart drugs. These are umbrella terms for a list of different compounds that can improve cognitive function like attention, memory, and learning. Now CE123 seems to be scarcely available online on more shady websites that say they are selling it, though they are likely to just put modafinil or filler inside their pills. The more interesting part of this is that out of all companies, Red Bull holds this patent. It is a bit ironic, considering Red Bull is seemingly against selling drinks that don't contain caffeine and caffeine in combination with modafinil or its analogs are generally not so good for you. So it seems like they will never use it anyway, since they don't sell anything besides caffeinated energy drinks. I would have made the compound and taken a caffeine-free Red Bull and then done what could have been, but like I said, they don't sell caffeine-free Red Bull and decaffeinating Red Bull, as we have seen, doesn't really work so well. Still, I want to try this compound for myself. So instead, we'll say goodbye to Red Bull and go make it and put it in some iced tea. Luckily, the synthesis is detailed in the patent, as well as multiple literature sources, and they seem to mostly agree with what is the best route of production. They all start from the two common and cheap reagents, diphenylmethanol and thiourea, followed by addition of a methyl thiazole group and an oxidation. Overall, that seems very achievable, so let's try it out. So to get started, I set up a flask with a stir bar in a heating block, and I add in 100 ml of water as a solvent. I then attach a funnel, and pour in 40 grams of the reagent diphenylmethanol. On top of that, I add 18.9 grams of the reagent thiourea. I attach a dropping funnel, and into that, I add 115 ml of 48% hydrobromic acid. I kinda brain farted with the flask kill here, and it's a little too small, but it might only just fit all together in the end. I first leave this mixture to stir at 90 C, and wait until it loosens up. When that happens, I dropwise add the hydrobromic acid and leave it to stir for an hour afterward. In this reaction, diphenylmethanol reacts with thiourea in the presence of hydrobromic acid to form this sulfide amidinium. First, the hydroxyl of diphenylmethanol is protonated by the acid and rapidly undergoes nucleophilic substitution to form the corresponding bromide compound. This can then be attacked by the nucleophilic sulfur of thiourea, moving an electron pair onto the sulfur while one of the nitrogens moves its free electron pair to form a double bond to make up for it. It kicks off the bromide and leaves us with the final amidinium product. When I return, the flask is overloaded and the product has partially crystallized out. I then leave it to cool down to room temperature so that the volume decreases, and I can then safely remove the dropping funnel without it overflowing. I then take this mixture and set it up for a vacuum filtration to collect the white solid, and I wash it with a bunch of water to get rid of the acid and the remaining starting material. Since it has some large chunks, I crush them with a pestle so that they can be washed properly. When that's done, I pour all of the solid out into this dish, but it is still wet from the water. So to dry it, I pour it all out into this flask, heat it lightly, and attach a short path distillation apparatus, on which I pull a vacuum. I leave that overnight, and it should pull out pretty much all of the water that is inside. When that's done, it is a dry powder that can be poured easily, in the end, leaving me with 60 grams of the first product, which is a fair yield of 86%. Now that this part is finished, I set it aside while I prepare the second required reagent. For that, I set up a new flask in an ice bath and first add in 80 ml of dichloromethane as a solvent. I then pour in 20 grams of this thiazole reagent, which are two full small bottles. I attach a dropping funnel in which I first add 20 ml of dichloromethane as a diluent, and then it is time to whip out the big bottle of thionyl chloride of which I add a humble 13 ml into the dropping funnel. I slowly drop in the mixture into the flask, and it reacts immediately, forming a precipitate and becoming cloudy. I let it sit in the ice bath for the duration of the addition, and I then let it stir for 14 hours at room temperature. 
In this reaction, the hydroxyl reacts with thionyl chloride and is replaced by a chlorine, releasing sulfur dioxide and hydrogen chloride gas. I've covered this mechanism a bunch of times before, and it's a common one and nothing new, so I will skip that. When it's done, it has become brown, and I move it to a heating block and remove all the solvent with short path vacuum distillation. Afterward, the product is left behind as a brownish green powder, which can be used as is for the next reaction. So to continue, I set up a large flask in a heating block and add in 750 ml of methanol as a solvent. I attach a funnel and dissolve all of the thiazole I just made. I wash it down with some methanol and then add in 50 grams of the amididium I made at the beginning. It also dissolves quickly and then as a base, I gradually add in 107 grams of potassium carbonate. When all of it has been added, I attach a condenser and heat the mixture to a reflux for 3 hours. In this reaction, the amididium is replaced by this methyl thiazole group by reacting with the 5 chloromethyl thiazole in the presence of a suitable base. First, all of the amididium is neutralized by the potassium carbonate, forming the corresponding amidine, potassium bicarbonate, and potassium bromide. Then, the sulfur can attack the electron deficient carbon adjacent to the chlorine, and then kick off the chlorine, which is a good leaving group, resulting in this intermediate. In this case, we can use bicarbonate as a nucleophile forming a short-lived intermediate, even though normally it's not a great nucleophile. We could also consider the formation of methoxide by the reaction of potassium carbonate and methanol, but that is very limited, and methoxide in methanol is not even a great nucleophile. So we can use bicarbonate, which also results in more likely products, like urea and carbon dioxide instead of O-methyl isourea. So, the amidine undergoes nucleophilic attack from bicarbonate, and the carbon-sulfur bond electrons move onto the sulfur, giving the final sulfide methyl thiazole product. The formed intermediate quickly falls apart into urea and carbon dioxide. When I return, it has become a cloudy beige mixture, and while hot, I immediately set it up for vacuum filtration to filter out the excess potassium carbonate and formed salts. I am then left with an orange red solution, which I set up for short path vacuum distillation to remove all of the methanol. I am left with some crap that contains the product, urea, and some impurities. I dissolve all of it in a small amount of dichloromethane. Then to purify it, I will pass it through a pad of silica gel, which will hold on to polar impurities and urea. So I set up a glass fit with a filter paper and put some silica gel on top. I wet it completely with dichloromethane. Let it pack and put another filter paper on top. I then pour all of the product dichloromethane mixture on top and let it run through with the aid of the vacuum. I then pass more dichloromethane through it to run through all the product separating the dark impurities from the product that passes through easily. Urea is not so soluble in dichloromethane, so as we see, it will just sit on top. I take all of the collected liquid, which is a yellow solution, and set that up for short path vacuum distillation to remove all of the solvent. When that's done, an orange liquid is left behind, which is the molten product, so I set it in the freezer to force it to solidify, and it is then an orange waxy solid that I break up with a spatula and the yield turned out to be 37.8 grams, which is a respectable 83%. The product isn't fully pure, evident by its interesting color, but it is pure enough to use for the next and final reaction. So for that, I dissolve it all into 370 ml of dry acetone. As the first catalyst, I add in 13.1 ml of l diethyl tartrate. And as the second catalyst, I add 11.5 ml of titanium isopropoxide. I let this mixture stir for 10 minutes to allow these to react, and then add in 0.33 ml of water as the third catalyst. I let it stir for 5 more minutes, and then reflux this mixture in a glycerol heating bath for 1 hour to complete the formation of the catalyst complex. After cooling to room temperature, I add in 4.44 ml of dippy as a base, and let it stir for another 10 minutes. The catalyst is now completely ready, which means I can add the oxidizer. So I slowly add 23.8 ml of the oxidizer cumene hydroperoxide. When that's done, I leave it to stir at room temperature for 20 hours. In this reaction, we are using a modification of the Sharpless epoxidation. The same conditions are used, which are often called Sharpless conditions. But water is added as an additional catalyst, and cumene hydroperoxide is used instead of third butyl hydroperoxide. This results in a combination that can be used to asymmetrically oxidize sulfides to sulfoxides, giving the S enantiomer of the sulfoxide as the major product. 
we could also do something more simple, like oxidation with hydrogen peroxide, but this would not be selective towards the desired S enantiomer. Since there is no specific literature about the catalytic cycle for this oxidation, I will just leave some literature to the Sharpless epoxidation below, since it should be quite similar. When I return the next day, the mixture has become orange, and the reaction should be finished by now. Since there's still remaining cumin hydroperoxide, I have to destroy it before concentrating the solution, otherwise it might explode. To do so, I add an excess of an iron 2 sulfate solution, which was found to quickly destroy all the peroxide in this mixture. Afterward, it is black and all the peroxide should be gone. So I set it in a heating mantle and start removing all the solvent with short path vacuum distillation. When it's finished, orange crab is left behind. And to dissolve it, I first add in 590 ml of cyclohexane and 75 ml of toluene. And then reflux this mixture for a few hours. At the end, it seems like it has all dissolved and only the iron crab remains undissolved and kindly sticks to the glass. Then, to precipitate the product, I pour it into 400 ml of cyclohexane, and it immediately becomes cloudy, and then allowed it to settle, but it settled as an oil, and not a solid, for which the literature calls for some extra workup. So I discarded all of the solvent, and then dissolved the remaining oil in some dichloromethane. I move this solution to a separatory funnel, and wash it twice with a 10% citric acid solution, and then twice with a 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide solution which in literature is said to fix this problem. So I take the washed dichloromethane layer and distill off all of the solvent, leaving behind an orange ish liquid. To force it to solidify, I add some 10 to 1 cyclohexane toluene mixture and shake it strongly. After leaving it to stir overnight, all of the oil splashed on the walls and luckily solidified to become an off-white solid. To collect it, I set it up for vacuum filtration, but a lot of it is stuck to the flask, so I have to scrape it off and wash it out with more of the solvent mixture. I then move it all to this dish, and the weight is 22.6 grams. But it is not pure yet, so I will have to do a few more things to make it suitable for consumption. The first thing I will do is column chromatography, which can separate components based on their polarity. For that, I first add all of the product to a flask and dissolve it in a minimal amount of dichloromethane. When it has all dissolved, I add a bunch of sea light, which will loosely hold onto the product when the solvent is removed. When enough has been added, I vacuum distill off all of the solvent, leaving behind an intimate mixture of sea light and a product, which will help it compress more cleanly into the column. Now I set up a column and weighed out about 200 grams of spherical silica gel. I mix that with the aluminum for this column, which is a 7 to 3 mixture of dichloromethane and ethyl acetate, and pour that into the column. If we take a look at the TLC of the product, which we can consider to be a small 2D version of the column, we see that there are only two spots which should be easy to separate, but it depends if the amount of silica is enough. Probably not, so there will be some overlap. Since the product is the bottom spot, I can just first run off the upper spot and then collect everything afterward. When the silica looks packed, I put a layer of sand on top to protect it and run some more aluminum through it to be sure. I then let the solvent level run into the sand and pour all of the sea light product mixture on top. After putting more of the aluminum through it and applying pressure on top, the product runs off the sea light and into the silica, where in this case, we can see it moving inside. Since that means I can just do it visually, I waited until all of the front running yellow color came off the column, and then collected everything that came afterward, which should contain the relatively pure product. When it's done, I collected one big fraction that I set up for vacuum distillation to remove all the solvent. Afterward, some liquid is left behind and I make sure all the solvent is gone by pulling a vacuum directly. It then quickly starts to solidify as it cools and I add some cyclohexane toluene mix to purify it more. And I also break up the formed solid. I leave that to stir overnight and afterward it became a lot more white. I set it up for vacuum filtration to collect the solid and then move it to this dish. Since the solid contains some rock hard chunks, I decided to crush them into a powder with a pestle and redo the washing with the cyclohexane toluene mixture. This step also improves the optical purity of the product but I don't have a way to measure it. Either way, both enantiomers are active, the S just more than the R. After letting it stir overnight, I again filter out the solid and just move it to the same dish, giving the product as a white powder. It still contains some residual solvent, and I don't feel like eating cyclohexane or toluene, so I will remove it by moving it to this flask and pulling a vacuum on it overnight. 
When that's done, I am left with 6.67 grams of the product as a white powder, which is a very unrespectable yield of 17%. I definitely lost over half of the weight with the column because I wanted to prevent taking the yellow part. And in the literature, they say mixed fractions were columned up to four more times. And I don't fucking hate myself, so I'm not doing that. At least the product is white. And um, it's all about the journey, the process, etc. Anyhow, now it is time to try it out. Since modafinil related compounds are safe and have a lot of research, and this one has some literature as well as anecdotal backing, I'm not too concerned. So I set up a drinking glass and I will just use Lipton Iced Tea Peach, so that it at least tastes good, and has very limited caffeine content. Into that, I add 100 milligrams of the product. We see that it doesn't really dissolve well, which is probably why it isn't so useful for using drinks, especially something like Red Bull. Ideally, it is just taken in a pill. Either way, I'll just drink this whole glass, and then go edit this video and work out, and see if it does anything. So the results, overall I think its effects were quite nice. No weird side effects, I really felt comfortable, focused and in my zone. I slept normally and the next day I still felt a bit better. It does feel like a slight dopamine increase. So I rate this compound a 7 out of 10. Nothing crazy, but still mild and good. I never tried modafinil, so I can't really compare it. So I let someone else try it who has, and he said that it was a milder version of modafinil, and that the effects in general were quite mild. That's all, see ya.